People are passionate about language, especially language change, and words matter. And nobody knows this better than Peter Sokolowski, who is an editor at the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, one of the most famous and most trusted dictionaries in the world. He has spent his life immersed in words and their meanings and all of the difficulties that come along with that work. In this interview, we talk about the role of the dictionary, standard and non-standard English, language and culture, and how dictionaries are a sign of profound human agreement and also profound disagreement. This is an edited version of our interview. If you would like to listen to the full version, you will find a link down in the description box. I hope you enjoy it. Before we start talking about some of the like kind of practical aspects of working on a dictionary, I wanted to just talk a little bit more about theory. And I actually wanted to, to start with, not, which is absolutely nothing to do with your work at all, but um, I noticed that when you were messaging me on Twitter, that in some of your messages, uh, you didn't use any capitals or punctuation. And I suspect that there would probably be people out there who are horrified to learn that, that you know, the editor at large of a dictionary, of a major dictionary, is sending messages without proper, <laughs> without proper English. <laughs> well, you know, we're not the grammar police. <laughs> and also, you know, language is an organic and, and, and utilitarian thing. And so the fact is, and I have a lot of fun with it. And often, if it, you actually look at my Twitter feed uh, that's public, um, you will see sometimes I will respond to individuals um, and there's actually become a kind of grammar for this uh, with no caps and no punctuation whatsoever that will make it clear to people that this is an, an aside, that this is a lighter tone um, or also a kind of intimacy, you know, that, that I'm responding to this person. And it might be clear to strangers that, oh, those two, po those two people have had exchanges before, or, you know, or, or, or they know each other. And uh, I find that comfortable. And also typing, you know, for uh, DMs, you know, direct messaging and things like that, I find it easier to do without capital, <laughs> capital letters. Um, but, you know, it's funny, too, because there's, a, there's an element of, of pre of kind of 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 ideas of prejudice against um, authority, you know, the, the sort of idea of a dictionary as an authority, and uh, I would say that that's a complicated relationship that that I have and that dictionary publishers generally have with this idea of authority. In other words, there is a paradox with dictionary publishing, especially the way we do it today, which is that the research is entirely descriptive in the linguistic sense, which is to say that we are reporting on the actual way that the language is used by real people in real publications. Um, and at the same time, we know that people come to the dictionary for prescription, you know, for calling balls and strikes. And I have to recognize that there is a tension between those two sort of fundamental missions and roles. Um, obviously, there's a prescriptive mission for a dictionary. We do tell you the, the, the conventional spellings, for example, of a word the conventional pronunciations um, and certainly the um, the com conventional gram grammatical uh, uh, identification that we would make with a word. Uh, but at the same time, we want to keep up with the language and reflect the changes that happen constantly to a living language. And so th that's the descriptive part. And the prescriptive part is sort of, in a sense, uh, acknowledging that there is enormous consensus uh, among the people who use English over a couple of thousand of, ye thousand of years and uh, many millions of people, uh, we've all agreed that a certain set of sounds mean a very specific thing. And to me, that's why I do believe that a dictionary is maybe the greatest evidence of human consensus that we have. Because if we can't agree that this set of sounds means this certain thing, we can't move on. We can't go to the next idea. We can't you know, communicate. Uh, clearly. And so I, I look at the dictionary as, as a kind of collection of evidence, evidence-based information um, that can help you um, at every level, whether it's just basic knowledge of what a word is to the higher level of usage, the cultural use of a word. Um, is it offensive? Is it uh, 
obsolete? Um, is it British? Is it, you know, all the kinds of the little nitty gritty cultural information um, that you also get from a dictionary. And so you might say, oh, that's prescriptive if you say that lorry is a British word, but actually that's descriptive. We are saying that we find that the word lorry used to mean a thing with four wheels that, that, that moves people um, is used more in Britain than it is anywhere else. And so that's our descriptive mission. But then we put that label on it too. And I don't, I don't know if I, if I answered your question, but I do find there's a kind of a descriptive mission, but also a prescriptive form to a dictionary. Yeah. And I mean, how do you feel about people using the dictionary as a tool for prescription? Well, the fact is, you know, you know, we are the official dictionary for the National Spelling Bee, for example. And so obviously, you know, we're, we're, we are determining the conventional spelling of a given word and it's correct or incorrect according to that given spelling that, that, we, that we provide. So the fact is, if you're using the dictionary for information, it's there for you. Um, and, you know, that is honestly a huge part of how we all use the dictionary. I do too. You know, I look up a hundred words a day, probably more than most people, but I often want to know, is that word hyphenated? Um, you know, is it capitalized? Are, are there, I have problems. Are there two L's or one L? Is it an A-N-T or an E-N-T? The same problems that we all have. And uh, there's certain words I'm sure we all have then that we have to look up every time we use them. That's just the way it is. It's the way language works. Um, so that uh, I'm very comfortable with the dictionary being a repository of information about language, and it's there for that purpose. Um, I don't like it when it's used as kind of a bat to hit other people with. Do you know what I'm saying? I, I, I feel like we can acknowledge that there's a convention that, uh, for example, in American English, we don't double uh, the L in, in inflections for, for words like canceled or traveled. Um, but that's just a convention. Um, I was once a pronouncer for a spelling bee in, um, in India. And because it was me, they were using American, uh, pronoun uh, American spellings. And there was a, 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 a speller, a young, you know, a 13 year old speller who spelled a word in what would be a conventional British spelling. I think there it was a word like neighbor or something with a U. And um, the judge uh, declared that the spelling was incorrect because it wasn't the American spelling. And I had to intervene and say, no, no, no. <laughs> that speller spelled the word correctly uh, in what is an absolutely standard way. And we recognize it in, in boldface letters as a variant in our dictionaries. So absolutely, we are going to accept that as a correct answer. So I, I, I just, I, I feel like we should look at the dictionary as a repository of information. And again, not as a not as a bat to hit other people with. I, I just think that's a bad use of, of the dictionary. It's a bad use of uh, any kind of cultural document. Yeah, um, and I'm wondering how, you know, especially now as we're moving towards, um, you know, much more recognition of, let's say, alternative, you know, dialects of English and non-standard, you know, uses, usage of grammar and vocabulary. Um, is, is there a sort of concern that maybe... Um, that, for example, by not representing African American English or something, that that it's um, almost promoting. Uh, I don't know. Like, there's this standard, correct way of speaking. When maybe there might be in the U.S., for example, there might be tens of millions of people who are using other forms every day. Um, like almost like the dark side of that of that authority, you know, from the dictionary. Absolutely. I mean, you're you're raising a very important point. And this gets to, uh, I think, the history of the culture writ large and the dictionary as a as a kind of uh, as a kind of uh, representative piece of evidence of that culture. The traditional way of making dictionaries was obviously based on published, edited prose. Um, and that was true for Samuel Johnson in the 18th century. It was true for Noah Webster in the 19th century. And it's true for us today. Now, in the 18th century, published edited prose basically meant books by white men. And therefore, Johnson's Dictionary and later Webster's Dictionary, they were, they were providing lots of evidence of words as they were used in examples and using examples from literature like Shakespeare and Milton and Spencer, but also the Bible was a very important source for, for these dictionaries, of course. But they were overwhelmingly the works of white men. And then as you move into the 20th century and the great um, 
uh, the great big unabridged editions. You can see one over my shoulder right there. That's the big second edition. It's a book that had 600,000 entries. It's a huge book. It weighs about 18 pounds. Um, that was the 1934 edition. The 1961 edition was highly criticized because it did something uh, not really for the first time, but in a very systematic way. It, it read not just the news stories at the front of the paper of newspapers, but it read the sports pages and it read the arts pages. And it started including words from fields that weren't just scholarship and literature, but for example, the, 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 the lingo of jazz musicians or of carpenters. Um, because those words were actually published and we were able to catch them. We, the, the, it was the only way we could find them was, you know, on, on paper. Now, um, that meant that there was a structure uh, of publishing that really favored one group of people. Uh, and that group of people tended to be the, the dominant economic uh, force of, of, of the European-based cultures and then the American cultures. And so now what we see is as we continue into now into the, the digital age where we can um, search much more quickly and, and find much more information, um, but also we're getting so many more uh, professional writers uh, who are not uh, white men writing about literature. Um, and so that we can give evidence of their use of language and, and in exactly the same way that we've always done this job, we can actually reflect a greater diversity of language because we are finally acknowledging that there are, are a greater diversity of writers. Um, and, and I mean that in the, in the broadest possible sense, uh, because a dictionary, I mean, like that 600,000 entries, we all use uh, these words, but there may be new words that we haven't found yet or new uses of existing words that we can recognize. The thing about standard English, as you mentioned, and I think that's a really important point because we are really measuring standard English. There's a lot in a dictionary, um, I think, uh, that uh, is kind of the center of the language. In other words, there's, there's a register of scientific vocabulary or technical vocabulary or idiolect that, you know, that, that may be a household word even, that is so rare or so rarely found in print that it won't get out to the world. You know, I, I use words every day with colleagues that we'll never put in our own dictionary um, because it's just an in-house term that we use. You know, uh, one is prawn. We say prawn. Do you, can you get me a prawn for that? And it just means pr pronunciation a phonetic transcription of a term. So can you give me a prawn for, but I mean, that is an in, in, talk about insider language, but there's another, there's another good word. My brother's field of art conservation uses a term for drying uh, 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 washed sheets of paper um, and you dry them in, uh, in an oven and they use the term ovenize which is perfectly transparent, it's easy to understand, and yet when you're treating uh, for conservation purposes a document from you know, the 18th century or something in that way, you're not baking, you know? And so even though it's a, it's a but here's a term that may never, again, may never make it to the dictionary, but it's transparent, it's useful, it's, in, it's, it's a technical term. There's also a lot of language that is simply always spoken and never written. And that's the, that's the level of language that we have the most trouble with because we don't have evidence for it. We need to compile evidence. And that's just the, the sort of basic library function job of a lexicographer is to accumulate evidence. Once we see or encounter a word once, then we need a lot more evidence because we typically say that a word needs to have widespread use, long-term use, and meaningful use in order to get into the dictionary. And we really need evidence uh, on all three fronts. And so uh, that's the problem with spoken slang. Now, with standard English, as you mentioned, so that's, that's why we have kind of a central, what I call like basic vocabulary that is shared by many people. That makes the core of you know, vocabulary uh, that you, that is recorded in a dictionary. Standard English is, you know, it, it's not a superior form of the language, but it is a privileged form of the language. And in a sense, we have to acknowledge that pr privilege, all of us, the teachers of English, the learners of English, and the lexicographers, and recognize that this is the, this is the dialect that is used for communication uh, in a professional, academic, international context. 
Um, it may not be the dialect of English you speak at home. Uh, it may not be the dialect of English that is spoken in your region. Uh, and, it, and it may be only one of several that you speak every single day. Uh, however, it is the easiest one to measure and that's the one that gets the greatest representation in the dictionary. So in a sense, it's a chicken and egg problem. Do you see, do you see what I'm saying? But I think to your point, um, it's a long answer, long winded uh, way to get around to this, but we can today recognize these other varieties much more quickly. And they themselves are um, found uh, in, in published sources much more readily. And so that they will be recognized because it's all English. Um, I mean, do you do, do you sometimes wish that you could put more information into your dictionary entries than, than you actually do? Oh, of course, <laughs> of course. Um, and, and you know, what's interesting is that now we can more than formerly. So one of the big uh, legacies, and it's it's actually something I did. I said this on Twitter once um, that the the big dictionary you see behind me actually posed a problem because once that was published 1934 then it came time for the next edition how do you how do you make a book even bigger than that and the answer was we can't and so the uh, immediate answer was because of the limitations of the printed page that editor in the 1950s and 60s um, said new rules we are going to be more strict with how we write our def definitions and which words are included. So the first thing he did is he threw out all proper nouns. They're gone. We're not going to define those anymore. And that saved a lot of pages from that dictionary. So in, in an encyclopedic dictionary such as that, which is called Webster's Second, typically called Webster's Second, um, you could look up Mount Rushmore. You could look up George Washington, the Eiffel Tower. You know, there were entries for those things. And basically, a proper noun, of course, is not... Well, maybe it doesn't carry meaning. It doesn't carry meaning. It's exactly... It's not lexical in that sense. It doesn't carry meaning. It's a label for a place or a person or a thing. And it was recognized, too, that an encyclopedia is a better place to get more information. All we could do is put a little skeleton of a definition, and it's insufficient. But he really wanted to save space. But also, it, philosophically, he said, you know what? We can define a word that carries meaning. We can't define these things, so we shouldn't be in the business of defining proper nouns. So we cut them all out. Um, and that saved a lot of space. And this idea of separating the lexical from the encyclopedic is a very fundamental one to, to lexicographers. Now, it, subsequently, you, you, you know, we just tried to make definitions very concise, um, very short, so there would be more room for other words. But now online, of course, we don't have those limitations for space. So the new work that we do ha is much more expansive. And we can give much more information, particularly information about usage and example sentences, which are two things that are really helpful for language learners. Um, and two of the three things that d d distinguish our or any uh, learner's dictionary from a dictionary written for native speakers. Um, the three things I would say are the, the, the vocabulary used in the definitions themselves is much reduced. So in our case, we defined about 100,000 words with a vocabulary of 3,000 words. So we, we had a self-imposed limitation. Um, secondly, we added many, many, many example sentences, usually complete sentences. So you get the syntax, the register, and the context of every word, which is unbelievably important. Um, I know that for me as a, as a learner, as a, as a bilingual person, as someone who speaks French, when I'm looking a word up in French, very frequently, it's not that I don't know the word itself. It's what I, I, I need to know what the damn preposition is. What, 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 what do you use at or to, you know? And so you need to know that syntactical um, con contextual uh, information. And finally, the third thing is idioms. Idioms, idioms, idioms. The, the metaphorical use of a concrete noun, I could eat a horse. Uh, you know, I mean, that is an incredibly powerful it, you know, a figurative use of language, and it requires uh, enormous explanation. What's funny and what I discovered in the process of working on our Learner's Dictionary is that we have so very few idioms in our dictionaries for native speakers, such as the big unabridged dictionary, very, very few. For example, I Could Eat a Horse is not in those dictionaries, but it is in our Learner's Dictionary because there is nothing more important than to define how the word horse is used when it doesn't mean horse. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, for me, uh, 
and I do entire workshops just on American English idiom for this purpose, because if you look up concrete nouns, cheese, hat, fish, horse, table, penny, they, they, are, they all have uh, metaphorical uses. And what I always tell teachers is that even in the first year of study, um, it, when it's very dangerous for students to think of language like math, and I think you know what I'm talking about, that this equals this. Bilingual dictionaries allow that, they allow for that uh, sort of, um, yeah, that, or, or that I was gonna say that almost like a fantasy, because when you're talking about concrete nouns, for example, it does work that way. I mean, sort of, you know, finger is droit and, you know, table is table, and you can just, you know, tie is cravat, and you can just go and kind of learn them like as if this equals this, as if it was a math problem. Of course, language isn't math. It doesn't work that way. And so I think teach the two most common idioms, by my estimation, to a 14-year-old first-year student or a 7-year-old first-year student or a 40-year-old first-year student. Um, piece of cake. You know, allow that speaker who in the, their own home language, they know that language is rich, that language is, has images, that language can tell a story. Piece of cake doesn't mean dessert. And so you have to, now we've got a little story. You've got a chunk of language that tells a story and you've electrified parts of the brain that were falling asleep in class, you know, that, that were, that had been, that had been just doing math with words instead of learning language. And so hold your horses and piece of cake. You know, those are two, I think, maybe the most common uh, idioms used in English. And I think every, at the end of a first year, every uh, student should learn them, partly because they, they take you out of the, the math kind of lesson and bring you into this idea of language as image, uh, language as metaphor. And metaphor is a higher plane of thinking. And so let's let's engage that to the extent that we can. And I mean, and these are chunks, you know, and, and fluency comes from the application of fixed forms uh, in, uh, in spontaneous uh, production. So you have to mix them. And the thing about idioms that's fascinating to me, and I learned this sort of by doing it, by working on it, is that they are immutable in form. That's how we define, that's how I define an idiom for myself, which is if you can change, if you can swap the order or any of the words, I could eat a horse. If, 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 if you ever said I could devour a horse, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean the same thing. If you could say a piece of cake, if you could say a slice of cake, well, you know what? No native speaker of English will ever understand that as anything but dessert. Um, and so, you have, and you notice that's the, that's the often a cue uh, for a language learner is when they say, uh, when they employ an idiom, but it's just one word off or two words off. And, uh, and, and then you realize, oh, right, I, I understand what they mean. Um, but the thing about idioms is you have to learn them literally as a chunk, you know, word for word. Yeah. I mean, I think um, those aspects of, of English specifically can be very intimidating for second language learners. I mean, I have an Oxford um, uh, idioms dictionary and that has 10,000 entries in it, 10,000 idioms. And that's, and I think another part of that, of course, is phrasal verbs, which, you know, which basically, I'm gonna say that's unbound because I think that you could probably find an unbound number of uh, verb and preposition combinations that, that instinctively native speakers could make sense of. but. You know, how can a dictionary contain all of that information? It's impossible. It's very, very difficult. Only the most common of those are included in our dictionaries for native speakers. We do have a much, much more comprehensive list in our learner's dictionary because we have to. And again, because horse around, um, you know, it, you, have to, you have to define that, that, you know, you have to explain what that means. Uh, and uh, I, I think that is incredibly rich. Of course, every language has idioms. You know, um, you know, we say it's raining cats and dogs, and in French you say it's raining rope. <laughs> and raining rope is a wonderful image. You think of, oh, it looks like, you know, it looks like rope coming down. So thick. Well, kind of thick, but it, it pleut des cordes, that's what you say, it, it, it's raining rope, or raining ropes in, in, the, in the French way. Um, um, but it's raining rope, uh, is is that's a that's a beautiful kind of poetic image that we can understand, but it means nothing in English. You know? um, so every language has them, of course, um, and that's another point: is that they're 
sort of fundamentally untranslatable, you know, that, that we have to learn them each, you know, and, and that's a, a measure of fluency also, you know, because you have to think, you know, what is that thing in English uh, uh, about horses when you're hungry, but not for horse, you know, and you have to think that through until you don't, until you're fluent with that idiot. Because, you know, you often see these things on the internet where they say, um, <clears throat> um, you know, here's a list of, 10 words from Japanese that are untranslatable into English. And then directly under the word, they give you the translation in English of the word. I, I will tell you that uh, that is maybe my only language pet peeve is people who call things un untranslatable because then they immediately tell you what it means. Um, but what they really mean is here's a clever and concise way of saying something, you know, and, and I'm sure you know, as a speaker of other languages, and I, I sure do, there's a few things in French that I wish I could do in English uh, that are just really concise and simple and just get right to the point. And there's plenty in English. English, God knows, that doesn't, uh, that, that, that is so um, uh, efficient compared to French. Um, even though paradoxically, of course, English has maybe twice the vocabulary of French, you know, and, and so you, what you realize is that we have different ways of expressing ourselves. And that comes out through the, you know, through the idioms and through the language, but language ultimately, and I always say this language is a habit. It's just a habit. That's what it is. It's, you have to acquire the habit and the habit comes through chunks, through patterns, um, you know, when, when teaching, uh, like a, sometimes people will be, you know, this gets back to an earlier question. They'll be surprised to see very informal spoken kind of language in our dictionaries, like, like, like the word, like, you know, uh, he was like a scientist or something. That's a pet peeve for a lot of English teachers and a lot, you know, and, and yet it's an absolutely real part of the language. We would not be doing our job if we did not account for that use of that, of that term. Um, so we do account for informal, very spoken language, but then we also account for very formal language like whom, which is a term that you could uh, maybe live without if, as a speaker of English, but many people are use it very carefully. And of course, it has a long history in English. So I always say recommend to, you know, teaching it. And it's a problem with object subject um, teaching as well, because English has a strong gravitational pull toward the front of a sentence. We really want uh, the subject to come at the front. Uh, whereas if you had a question such as whom do we ask, where the object is actually first, our ear still wants to hear that subject first, which is, which is my kind of rationalization for, for explaining why we very frequently, including me, we say, who, who do we ask about this? And so we've replaced the object with the subject form, and yet grammatically it's still functioning as an object. It's very confusing to a speaker of a romance language, for example, for whom you cannot make that mistake. You cannot possibly mistake the object for the subject, for example, with me and I, which we do all the time in English, um, but we, which you simply can't do in French or Spanish or any uh, romance language. So. I always say, hey, it's patterns. It's patterns. If you're teaching uh, the object of a preposition and it's it's it, and 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 that's the 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 word of the day, um, you know, get it in your ear. It's to whom, to whom, to whom, for whom, for whom, for whom, by whom, by whom, by whom, with whom, with whom, with whom. You know, get yourself used to it. And that is the more common place to find that particular term is, is as the object of a preposition. Um, and we can deal later in an advanced class with the fact that you, the object sometimes comes at the beginning of a sentence. <laughs> but that's, that's the problem of English. The problem of, of, of the learner, um, if they want to make that distinction, it, ultimately it comes down to patterns and chunks so that, that when, you, when you hear that preposition, you will naturally go to the object, objective case, to that object form. And uh, so I always recommend that kind of pattern work um, with, uh, with teachers because, you know, again, language is a habit. And that goes for accent, for phonetics. They, people often ask me about phonetics. And I do something I've, I've worked up for uh, ESL, which is a, um, instead of a spelling bee, it's a pronunciation B. Um, so I'll put a word up on the screen and have the, the, the learners, or they're usually teachers who have themselves learned English, um, have them say the word. And of course we pick all these tricky, difficult words <laughs> that, are, um, that have uh, different, different uh, clusters and, and different diphthongs and you know, different elements. And I'll talk about you know, uh, vowel distinctions, vowel values, and, and funny things that just for the, for, for the teacher's own edification, um, you as a teacher, uh, you, you do not have to produce a native English sound, of course, that's, that's, not, that's not necessary. Um, but also 
um, you should be aware of things like the pin pen distinction that we have in American English or the Mary, Mary, uh, Mary distinction that some people have or caught and caught, you know, the, 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 all these. And what's funny is even among a, a room full of teachers who speak perfect fluent English, um, you'll see their eyes cross. You'll see them say, wait a minute. Um, and uh, but that's kind of fun for them. I'm mean, just simply exposing them to um, more of what you know, of what English, ha English is infinite, you know, more of what they love. Yeah, um, well, I, I wanted to sort of talk to you a little bit more about um, language philosophy, because mm, you've got something pinned to the top of your Twitter feed. It's been pinned there since 2013. And it says, most English speakers accept the fact that language changes over time, but they don't accept the changes made in their own time. Um, so why do you think that is? Oh, that's just, that's because language is a habit. That's because language is a habit. If you grew up, for example, as I did, um, hearing the word impact uh, only used as a noun, uh, then every time you hear it used as a verb, you notice, you know, and you think, at first you think that's an error. And then later you kind of get used to it and you think, well, I, you know, I, I understand it, of course, and then finally, you have to make a choice. Am I going to use it? <laughs> um, and so in the, in the case of impact, for example, I don't use it as a verb. <laughs> um, now, I will die for your right to, to, to use impact as a verb, but I choose not to. Is, but at, at about the same time, maybe a generation ago, there was another word that was all, always used as, that had always been used as a noun that started to be used as a verb. And that word was access. And I wrote an academic article back in the mid 90s using access as a verb. And it was crossed out by the editor of the journal. And in red ink, it said computer jargon. And yet today, uh, we all probably use access as a verb five or six times a day. And here's the difference. Frequency, right? It's frequency. And so uh, as David Crystal says, frequency breeds contempt. <laughs> you know, so... So it's true that I use access as a verb today and I don't use impact as a verb today because of frequency. I, I, I encounter uh, access as a verb much more frequently than I encounter impact as a verb. So for me, there's still a rub uh, with impact. There's, there's no rub with access. So my, my point about this is that we can see language change almost in real time. Um, there, are, there are a lot of examples of this. I mean, oh, most of them are invisible. Uh, a word like wonderful, uh, which like so many other terms in English, originally meant something more literal, you know, um, full of wonder. Kind of like the word awful meant full of, uh, full of, full of wonder also, you know, full of, full of awe, um, awesome, you know, similarly. Terrible meant, you know, you know uh, causing terror. Um, uh, and in the case of wonderful, it meant astonishing. Um, today we use it to mean excellent, don't we? We had I had a wonderful cup of coffee, you know, um, and so we that the meaning of this term has been bleached over time, and we just simply use it to mean excellent. But it originally meant full of wonder. So I, I started thinking, let's look back at, at the at the usage. Let's look at the King James Bible, for example, which is a great example of good, you know, written English of 1611 or, or whatever it was. And look at the word wonderful and the way it was used at that time. And often you would see things, it would say something like, uh, God, thou art wonderful in thy plagues. And you'd think, well, there's nothing wonderful about a plague. But you realize, oh, they mean astonishing. They mean, you know, creating fear. Um, and they do not mean excellent the way we do. And then uh, I encountered it in the, in the 19th century, a letter from uh, Thomas Jefferson. Um, at, at the end of his life, he was in his 80s, and he was writing about um, the revolutionary period. And he said, you know, this 45 years after the fact, after these events, it is not wonderful that I should not recall the details. And I realized in that context, it's very clear that he didn't mean excellent. He meant surprising, right? He meant astonishing. And then I said, okay, let's pull it into the, you know, later in the 19th century. I looked, because now we can do this with online corpora, I went through Abraham Lincoln's correspondence. And sure enough, he used wonderful only in that way. Astonishing. And then I brought it and then I realized, oh, right, the the wonderful Wizard of Oz, which was published in the 1890s, 
it doesn't mean the excellent Wizard of Oz. It meant the scary Wizard of Oz, the terrifying Wizard of Oz, the astonishing Wizard of Oz. But you can see what we call um, this sense drift happened. It basically is a 20th century phenomenon that this word went from meaning one thing, its literal original meaning, to the way that it is universally used, so universally used that we actually literally misunderstand um, without enough context. So if you see a wonderful plague in the Bible, you'll, you'll, you'll be cued that there's something, there's something about the meaning of this that's different. Um, it is not wonderful that I can't remember something 45 years ago. It, you, we get a clue. We know there's something wrong there. But the wonderful Wizard of Oz is not enough context. And it's so easy for us to superimpose our contemporary definition on the old one. So another example of this is mean, as in mean girls, un, un, uh, you know, uh, unfriendly. Um, that is also a 20th century con construction. So mean originally meant um, lowly or, or you know, uh, or, or non-noble. Um, and if you look at, look it up in Shakespeare, you know, there are nobles and then the, the, the mean, a mean man is, is a commoner. Um, later it meant uh, um, stingy, which is a use that's still made in British English and possibly in your idiolect too. Um, and then finally, in the 20th century, it came to meaning, uh, you know, un unfriendly. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, and so the, the, that drift, it, but the point is that unfriendly meaning is so overwhelmingly common today that it seems to have washed out the earlier ones, at least in American English. We don't use the stingy meaning practically ever in American English. And it's only historical. You'd find it in Dickens, for example. You'd find it in... Um, other, other senses. And so um, my point being that language changes right before our eyes and we don't even see it. Um, but the ones that we do see, the few that we do notice, they tend to irritate us, um, especially if we were schooled by a teacher who, who, who taught us to care about language. And so when, when someone um, says to me that, hey, the dictionary is throwing the baby out with the bathwater, you know, that, 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 we're, that we are actually sanctioning or recommending improper usage by recording actual usage, I will first of all celebrate the fact that this person loves language so much um, that they care about the, the way a word is defined in the dictionary. And, 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 uh, and, and, and that's something that we share. Um, but then I'll have to explain it. And a, a, a classic case that's uh, kind of been in the news recently is irregardless. Um, it's not a word that I use. It's not a word that I recommend you use. However, there's so much evidence of this word in print that we are required to record it in the dictionary. It, we would be derelict in our duty if we didn't account for this word. Now, it's clearly a hypercorrection or an error, whatever you want to call it. Um, we can talk about its usage. Its usage is clearly non-standard. And you, you, you know, if you care about the way you're, you're presenting yourself in, in words, you shouldn't use this word. And we say that at the, at the, at the dictionary entry. However, we do record the form because it's an error that gets published fairly frequently uh, and has been around for a couple hundred years. And so, um, and I think one of, the, one of the compelling reasons to put it in a dictionary of English is for a learner of English who has become a good fluent speaker of English, if that person encounters irregardless, there's a logical problem. They will say, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. And if they look it up, they'll realize, ah, I see. This is a hypercorrection or this is the, the addition of, a, of an extra syllable um, that might be emphatic or who knows why, but whatever it is, it's an error and I will use regardless instead. <laughs> um, but the, the point is all of that information we can give in the dictionary. I, I, I heard um, Corey Stamper, who I believe is a colleague of yours, um, in, a, in a podcast talking about, um, I think it was a few years ago when some um, conservative radio commentator discovered that in the Merriam-Webster dictionary um, that you had listed under the definition of marriage that you'd also listed same-sex couples. And you received death threats, I, I believe, at the office. Um I mean, why, you know, it's like you said, people obviously feel so passionately about this, but it seems irrational sometimes, you know, like, for example, people uh, really don't like it when people use literally in a figurative way, you know, like I was literally dying of thirst or, um, or the singular they, which was actually your word of the year um, last year. Um, I mean... Where, where's the line between 
I'm sort of wondering where's the line between feeling passionately about language, but also teaching people to kind of be tolerant of change or, um, because it's something you mentioned before, right? Like a lot of people, they feel so passionately about singular they or irregardless because they had a teacher who was like, no, look, here's strunk and white, you know, don't say that. Or, I mean, how, how do you feel about maybe the philosophy of prescriptivism outside of the dictionary? Well, I think for, and, and, you know, marriage is a good example and there's, there are, there are others and we get, we do, we do get, uh, we do get a lot of angry mail for sure. Um, about a number of different terms, but, um, I think we start with, and you use the word philosophy. We start with the idea that there is a philosophical distinction between a d defining a word and defining a phenomenon. We are not d dictating to you what marriage is. We are dictating what the word marriage denotes and connotes, you know, and what, how, and so we, for example, an, an easier way to kind of take a little bit of the, um, uh, a, a little bit of the, the sort of tension out of it is to talk about a different word, like a word like love, uh, which is weirdly enough looked up very frequently in the dictionary and especially around um, uh, Valentine's Day. Now, the fact that it's the number one word in our data around Valentine's Day, I think is fascinating. And it, it, I don't think it's because of spelling. You know, I don't think people are looking up the word for spelling. Um, however, uh, I think that what they are looking up, we, we got a letter into the office once and um, uh, the question was, how long does love last? And you don't answer it in your dictionary definition. And so we had to respond to this person saying, you know, we are defining the word as a label for a feeling. We are not defining the feeling that you have. Those are two different things. We're not defining the phenomenon of for example, um, uh, inflation, you know, financial inflation. We're defining what inflation means when it refers to uh, financial transactions and, and currency growth or whatever. Um, so the fact is we have to make that philosophical distinction first and foremost. We are describing the usage of these words. We are not describing what you should be feeling or how you should think. Uh, we're not describing uh, what an emotion uh, is. We are defining what the label of that emotion is, you know, those are, so those are two different things. Um, in the case of marriage is a really good one too, because it shows stages of descriptive development. So initially it said a man and a woman, you know, whatever that the language was. And then su subsequently we added a second, a subsense, A and B, um, a, 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 a contract or a relationship similar to that of a conventional marriage, but between two people of the same sex. So we basically said it's, we acknowledged the, and that's the one that actually that, that Corey was referring to, this uh, second sense. Um, but we still separated them because in the evidence that we had, the usage of that term in newspapers and books and magazines, when marriage was used to describe a same-sex marriage, it was almost always described in that way. They would call it gay marriage or same-sex marriage, or they, they would have some kind of a description describing term and it wasn't standing on its own to mean this exact same thing as, con as, as, a, as a conventional or traditional marriage. Now, if you look it up today, we simply use the term spouse. There, there's only one definition and we combine them together between two people, you know, but that's because today we have absorbed as, as a culture, we have absorbed the idea of gay marriage so deeply that we no longer routinely refer to gay marriage as gay marriage, we just simply say marriage. So in other words, th these three stages of this definition show the absorption into the culture of this idea and then its reflection in the language. And our definition has reflected those three stages. The first one, the traditional one, the second one, the marked uh, gay, uh, same sex version, and finally the unmarked uh, acceptance of that in, into the culture. And that's a great, I think, a great example of descriptivism at work, which is to say that we are trying to be accurate and not, you know, you know, activism doesn't change the dictionary. Activism changes the language. Um, and when many people use the term in a way that offends fewer people, that's good for everyone. Uh, but it's not something, it's not an action that's led by the dictionary, it's an action that's reflected in the dictionary. Be beautiful explanation. Um, and, and, and I'm actually wondering, um, 
because I've seen you talking a little bit recently about the, the culture right now and about how you're a little bit maybe worried or, or afraid about what you consider to be maybe the war on meaning? Well, there is, there has been, you know, there's clearly a war on meaning when we have to deal with ideas like alternative facts and, and fake news. And when, 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 when it's clear that the rhetoric uh, in terms of the news or, or, the, or the politics um, is attacking the, the, the vehicle, you know, that we have language um, itself, that when they're, when they're using words uh, in, in ways that when they're, they're actually refusing the meanings of these words. Um, and that, that, that hurts everyone. You know, as I said before, consensus is what language is really, uh, it, it, uh, is, is what is at the origin of all language. It, it, you know, two, two people at some point had to agree on a set of sounds to mean a certain thing. And if we don't have that, we don't have anything, you know, but at the same time, there's a hopeful element to this because, we have at Merriam-Webster a huge amount of data. Um, 100 million words looked up a month, um, 100 million page views at the website, and a couple billion words looked up a year on our phone app. Um, so it's a huge amount of data. And what we can see is uh, by the minute sometimes, which words people are looking up in real time. Uh, according to the news. And what we see is that people are really paying attention, um, not just to the pandemic terms, but to political terms, to words in the news, um, words used by leaders. And it's not that they're, uh, you know, we're good at reading data, we're not good at reading minds. I don't know that people are trying to correct uh, the words of a politician or, uh, or the spelling of a politician's uh, tweets or something. Um, sometimes we see data that shows people are following that very closely. And what that tells me is that words matter, that people are paying attention, that the dictionary serves as sort of a neutral and objective arbiter of meaning at a time when meaning is in crisis. And so uh, I think the dictionary has always served that function, but it might be more ac accentuated today. And of course, the dictionary is more accessible today because we're carrying it in our pocket. You know, you can look up a word immediately. Um, and I think that's terrific. I think the dictionary is being used more perhaps than ever for that reason, because we're so accessible. And you might have the app or just go on, on the web on your phone and you can look words up. But that, new, that, funk, that role, that neutral objective arbiter of meaning is something that uh, I think all dictionaries have have had in the past, but is important today. And so uh, that makes our role in the, in, the, in the political discourse, whether it's about, for example, when, when gay marriage was a political issue, which is now in the past, it was 16, 17 years ago in the United States when that was a political issue, the, 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 the definition was the question. You know, the definition of marriage was the issue. Um, there are also political issues in, in the United States about the about abortion. And yet we never see the word abortion looked up because the meaning of the word is not the political issue. Do you, do you, see, do you see what I'm saying? Uh, and so when, when uh, and so, for example, with the term they, uh, we see that many people are recognizing that there are many people who prefer to, to be referred to with they and them, or who are simply using it more frequently. It's important to recognize too that, you know, the dictionary reflects the language uh, which reflects the culture. Um, and so uh, we are not prescribing or ordering you to use these words in this way. We are describing uh, the consequences of changes in the culture that have resulted in changes in the language. And that's a really important role, but it's one that we take seriously and it, it's one that we can always provide, provide evidence for. In other words, you know, when we make a change to a dictionary definition, when we add a definition to the dictionary, for example, or add a new word to the dictionary, it's on the basis of a huge amount of evidence and research. And uh, that, is the, that, is, that gives me the confidence uh, to look in our reference and to see, you know, what did we say about this last year? What did we say about it 10 years ago? What did we say about it 100 years ago? Um, and uh, we can find uh, over time an honest representation of the best scholarship that we knew how to do. I know that we have, you know, different standards um, because we can do so much more research today than we could in the past. Um, so we can find more 
uh, evidence. And therefore, to me, we have higher standard today than we ever have had in the past because we can really do, we can dig down, we can go further back in time to see how the word was used in the, you know, 15, 1600s, in the early days of print uh, uh, that's now searchable. Um, and of course, now we can use corpora to discover uh, how many times it was used yesterday. Um, and that's, that's really exciting for a lexicographer. I mean, th that was never available before. And so what you're getting, therefore, is more evidence-based research and less of the individual's sort of prejudice that you might have gotten in older dictionaries from older generations. And part of that was that the job was you, you, you had to sit at a desk and, and, you know, create knowledge and you only had a small stack of, of quotations to deal with. Whereas now you might have hundreds or thousands of them uh, and, and you can perhaps make a better assessment of what that word means according to a wider census in, in, in a sense of uh of its usage and so that's really that's really interesting to me i mean there, there's a point about dictionary definitions that i i think um is not obvious regarding this prescriptive descriptive divide and that is that i think there are two kinds of facts given in a dictionary definition there's the linguistic fact which is the spelling conventional spellings the phonetics conventional phonetics and the traditional uh, uh, use, uh, uh, usage based meanings of those terms but then there's the cultural facts of this word um, is it archaic is it obscene is it offensive is it british is it um, uh, is it uh, disparaging you know uh, there there are so many different ways that we can indicate that the company this word keeps uh, will tell you more about the, the appropriateness of this word in a given context than its isolated definition by itself. And so that cultural fact, the usage, so for example, we'll say it irregardless, use regardless instead. We tell you this is a non-standard term and you should, you should avoid it if possible. Um, but at, at another term like lorry, it will indicate that it's chiefly British. Um, and maybe that's all you need to know and you can move on and it might answer a question for you. But I do think it's important to separate them philosophically. The cultural fact is not lexical. You know, the, the, the cultural fact has no bearing on uh, the, the, the spelling, for example, of, of this word, um, except in weird, rare patterns, like British English typically puts U's in places that American English doesn't, you know, that kind of thing. But um, typically those cultural facts are given in what we call usage notes or usage labels. And that's because we have to recognize that this, um, this, this series of letters that you could isolate as a lexical fact also has a cultural role to play. And uh, we can't ignore that. And so we try to give as much as, of that information as we can in a dictionary. And, and it's really important in terms of words uh, that are likely to cause offense, for example. Um, it's really important to make it very plain um, that those are terms that uh, will cause offense. Um, uh, and, and if you look up those offensive words in a dictionary, and I recommend you do because, you know, that's a good way to test a, a new dictionary and also to see what kinds of information you get. And uh, it's very important for English language learners dictionaries to have extremely clear labeling for offensiveness and region. That that would be, <laughs> I mean, normally that's that's the first thing that teenagers do, right? When they get the dictionary, they look up the bad words. But but that's interesting advice. Maybe that's the first thing that um that anybody should do when they're looking at a dictionary is look up the kind of difficult words, the offensive words, to see how good is this information that I'm getting. Absolutely, and does it correspond with your cultural knowledge? Um, and I I have to say that it, it, as you as you well know. Uh, a learner of a language can't can't have the experience of growing up on a playground hearing that language spoken um, and registering as a as a as a as a first person experience uh, the level of offensiveness of some terms uh, and so they therefore have to learn that you know that has to be acquired information until they become fluent and maybe very experienced in the language um, they will not understand. Uh, that, for example, you know, across different languages, what you might consider to be parallel uh, terms of offense uh, may actually not 
uh, match up in terms of their offensiveness. And so uh, that's something to be very, very careful about. And, you know, it, it may be that that's more advanced than most teachers get into in the classroom. But I think of our learner's dictionary as a dictionary that is made um, as a teaching tool. Um, and what I mean by that is when the teacher is not there to help, that the student can can read it alone, you know, can can read it without a teacher uh, present. And that's why they're written that way. They're written in a very basic kind of English. Uh, I call it plain English, not baby talk, but plain English so that so that it's understandable so that um, that even um, outside of the classroom, uh, they can get the information that they need. And it's really important that they get usage information as well as the rest of it, spelling and meaning and, and phonetics. Well, um, I think that was actually a fantastic way to end the interview because um, cause, like, it was just a beautiful philosophy about language. It's a treat to talk to you. Mm-hmm.